good morning. Our notes say October 31st, but that was last week. Remember, next week is uh, Richard Pratt will be here. And then the following week, I will be gone. And the following week will be Thanksgiving break. So we'll do that first weekend in December. We'll finish up this class. So we got a lot of notes today. We'll see what we can get done on this chapter. It's like he's getting to the end of his book, and the chapters seem to get longer. Um, he's kind of talking about Christian character. And so today, the, the statement is the, the, the uh, title, Nice People Are New Men. He's going to make a case for or against the niceness of Christians, which is a horrible word, but you get the general idea. So we're going to pray, and we'll do this thing. Is that good? Can we pray? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. So Lord, be honored even now. Uh, for those who aren't here, we pray for them, whatever it is they're, they're dealing with as we move towards Thanksgiving. Uh, I think of all the college kids as they come back, keep them safe. These guys are us as we travel. I pray for this morning as Kent preaches, for the music, for those who are here. Uh, you'd move in, move in our hearts that we might be more like Jesus. May we enjoy each other this morning. Uh, thank you for each person in here. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so here we go. So Lewis starts, and we'll work through this pretty quickly, I think. It's a lot of notes. Uh, you'd think I'd cut a bunch out, but I, I don't always feel it's, it's his book, not mine. He asked the question, is Christ, if, if Christianity is true, why, why aren't all Christians obviously nicer than all non-Christians? That's a good, it's a good question. Why are Christians sometimes such jerks? You're a Christian after all. And he says it is reasonable, and I, I'm going to summarize this part pretty quickly. He said, really, if you look at G, he said it's a reasonable and a question because Christ told us to judge by results. And so if, if we say that, that J, when we Christians behave badly or fail, fail to behave well, we're making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. So he says that that's a, it's a legitimate question on one hand. Um, we give them grounds for talking in a way that throws doubt on the truth of Christianity. So he says there, there is truth there. That, that maybe we should expect Christians to, to act in ways that are maybe kinder than non-Christians. But he says it's also, then when you jump to page two already, how quickly time flies. But it's also unreasonable. There's another way of demanding results in which the outer world may be quite illogical. Uh, they may demand, this is B on page two, not merely that each man's life should improve if he becomes a Christian, they also, may de also demand, before they believe in Christianity, that they should see the whole world neatly divided into two camps, Christians and non-Christian, Christian and non-Christian, and that all the people in the first camp at any given moment should be obviously nicer than all the people in the second. So he says, Here, here's the unreasonable part. You, you break the world into Christian and non-Christian, and every Christian should be nicer than every other, every non-Christian, and if they're not, I'm not going to believe in it. And he says, that's just not, that doesn't make sense. And he's going to give some reasons why it doesn't make sense. Here's the first place. The world's so much more complicated. We're so much more complicated. Uh, the world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. Here's his argument. His argument is uh, there, there are so many people that are in transition from moving from not being Christians to being Christians. That's his first one. Is There are people, a great many of them, this is number one with the italics around it, uh, with the parentheses around it, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians. Uh, whatever. That would be, I would say, again, that's his worldview. I would say they're ceasing to exhibit the Christianity that they grew up with, whatever it comes with the ever. So they're, 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 they're becoming more honest with who they are. But there are people coming the other direction, that Christ is moving in their hearts. There's a time at which you come to know Christ. But I think, that, that I think one of the signs is you begin to be aware of your own sin. And as you become aware of your own sin, even though you may not know Christ yet or you're not aware that you know Christ yet, because uh, I would say you, know, you become a Christian well before you become a Christian. Uh, the Spirit of God works in you, and then you, you realize it and vocalize what is already true. So in that process, you may not officially be a Christian, but you're becoming aware of your sin, and you're actually becoming a kinder person, a nicer person, if you want to use I don't like that term, but you're becoming a, a more compassionate person. Why? Because you're aware of your own stuff. Um, and then here we go, three is just, again, there's people who are attracted um, and, and, and more than they understand. And so he says it's more complicated because people are in all sorts of different places in relationship to Christianity. Uh, you also can have Christians that are extremely angry. Something's just happened, and uh, they're really angry at God, but there's nowhere else to turn. And so the, the, what you see is not a very gentle, kind person. You see them working out their anger. Um, 
And then number five on page three with, with the parentheses. And as always, of course, there are a great many people who are just confused in mind and have a lot of inconsistent beliefs all jumbled up together. Just because you become a Christian and the Spirit changes your heart, it, it, the, the process of, if you want to use sanctification, of, of growth into the character of Christ is a lot of hard work. Um, and Lewis will make the point, you can agree with it or not, but he would say in some of these areas, um, you, you do have some freedom to, to choose to move that way or not. Um, I, 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 this, this dance between human responsibility and sort of the working of God through the Spirit, I think the Spirit is moving us towards Christ's likeness, but certainly not at the same pace in everybody. And somewhere in, the, in there, our, our own human volition plays a role, but I don't quite know how to define that. So I would, either, either there's a bunch of people that don't really know Christ and say they do, or the process can be really slow in lives. Maybe it's slow in our lives, and I'm not very self-aware. Uh, but some people who claim to know Christ, it seems, you hang with them and you think, what? But I'm... I, how, how do you even define that? How do you even describe it? I'm not their judge. Um, and so it, it's just much more complicated. Um, Calvin had his church, uh, and, and he said he would be surprised, he would have been surprised if 5% of his congregation were actually Christians. <laughs> That's pretty low. Sure, that would be part of it too. Or niceness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a cultural, here's what we expect. Right. Um, Christians, you know, I, I, some people would look at Christians and say, you, you, you stand up and, and you're angry at something? How can you do that? I grew up in a world where you don't get angry. Well, real Christians don't get angry. I'd say, yeah, of course they do. Real Christians get really angry. And so, yeah, if you're a non-Christian and a Christian gets angry at you, you're like, well, you're not really a Christian. We were playing basketball one day against Palmer Trinity, and... Um, we had just won the game. I may have told you this because it's a funny story. The, the girls scored at the last second, and we beat Palmer, you know, the, the arch rival. And we were wa I was walking out to the car behind a mom and her daughter. I think her daughter had been on the team. And um, the mom said to the daughter, without me hearing, can you believe they're Christians playing like that? And I thought, yeah. So then I, I flicked her in both ears, and I said, you got it, loser. <laughs> so, but I'm not a Christian. I'm a Buddhist, so have at it. So... Um, so then he says, consequently, it's not much use trying to make judgments out of Christians and non-Christians in the mass. Kids will come time, sometimes come to me and they'll say, do you think so-and-so is a Christian? I, say, I don't have, how, how, how would I know? I, I know what they say. I, you know, I, but, but I think the bottom line is you, you do see the fruits. Um, I, I don't think necessarily church attendance determines it, but you're, you're, certainly your um, relationship with Christians would be a key. So that may work itself out in, in church attendance. I would say up to this generation it probably has, but I'm watching this younger generation where maybe it doesn't, and maybe they're wrong, maybe I just don't get it. But, but what do you feel about other Christians? I, you know, you'll hear people say, I love Christianity, I just hate Christians. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. If we have the same spirit in us, um, but when we're comparing Christians in general with non-Christians in general, we're usually not thinking about real people whom we know at all. There you go. There's who's making the judgment. And it's sort of a caricature. But only about two vague ideas which we have got from novels and newspapers. Again, remember he says, I'll be right there, Christianity is for, for grown men, grown, grown adults. And even here, you can't make this pretend little dichotomy. Yes, sir, Jerry's talking. The, yeah, putting us into one or the other. Because I think another factor that Age might be another factor, he says. Hard knocks. Okay. Then Hard knocks. Tends to mellow you. Yeah, that's good. But there's a lot of, yeah. That explains you very much then, right? Yeah, as you get older, you, he said the hard knocks, you get beat up and it tends to mellow you. Yeah. So generally, what's interesting is people get older, they go one or two generation, directions. You'll see some that just get so angry. And they're looking back at their life and they're angry at it and others who... Like you say, they're just more mellow. Yeah. 
I would say another aspect would be different areas of our lives, um, we have different responses, maybe different levels of maturity. So in one area of my life, I might respond in a way that people say, oh, you're a Christian. In another area, I might respond and they'd say, what's your problem? Um, do, you, do you know anything about Christianity? Just because we're fractured in, in different areas. Here's the second thing, he, reason why he says it's an illogical question to, to make this dichotomy. We often ask the wrong questions. Uh, the wrong question, shouldn't a Christian be nicer than the same person would be if he were not a Christian? Shouldn't you necessarily then be nicer if you're a Christian? And that is, same question really, shouldn't you be nicer than you were before? Uh, a better question, he says, and this gets a little, like a little unclear, I think. Does that management, if allowed to take over, improve the concern? That is, is the general tendency to move towards, and I, again, not nice, but, but, a, but, a, but a, someone who treats others more fairly and more consistent in what we do. And then here's the third one, he says, and some people are just nicer than others. So depending on where you start, someone who's not a Christian can be like the nicest person in the world. And he says, so to compare them to a person who, a Christian, but is just sort of a nasty person, you're going to look at the non-Christian and say they're nicer than the Christian. Well, they are. But that's personality, not spiritual, he says. So like we do Myers-Briggs with the kids. I'm a feeler. So I tease a lot, clearly, but when I do, I always say, you know, I'm just kidding. Someone's a thinker. We have a friend who's a thinker, math teacher, and when he teases you, if it bothers you, he just laughs. <laughs> because he's not, hurting your, he's not out to hurt your feelings, but he's a thinker. He just, get over it. I'm only teasing. A kid in class the other day started to tell us about uh, why she was excited about getting married, and somehow it turned into a laughing thing, and a kid made a joke, but he's a thinker, and it really hurt her feelings. And I tried, to, I tried to confess for him. I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. You know, that, well, it wasn't on purpose, and it sort of blindsided all of us. And she said, she looked at me and said, I'm not expecting a, 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 um, an apology from you. And then she looked at him, but from somebody else. And she looked right at him. He didn't get the clue. He didn't ever apologize. He just, it just never even crossed his mind that he had said something inappropriate. So she came back later and told me what she wanted to say to the class. But by those standards, and he wasn't very nice. Now, he may be a Christian, but just personality-wise, his humor is a little bit more caustic. So some people are more caustic than others. They're not safe. Uh, I think most people just aren't safe. Uh, but maybe none of us are safe, depending on where you get us and when you get us, what time of day it is. There you go. After drug, A.D. <laughs> yes, sir. Bob's talking. That's good. So he's saying people who come to know Christ, maybe through E.E. or something else, come to know Christ and say that's it. Right. So what they need is to be mentored. Yeah. Well, there is the Holy Spirit is working in them. I'd have two answers to that. One would be, if they go nowhere, did they really come to know Christ? That'd be the first question. And, and if they came to know Christ, though the process might be slower, the Spirit is working. So I would say, if you come to know Christ, you're, 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 you're on the roller coaster, you, 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 know, you went, and now there's no getting off. So I would argue that, I mean, I think churches are full of people I, oh, see, I don't know. I, that's not a fair statement. It's possible that churches are full of people that don't know Jesus. Yeah, so, so then this question becomes an, a, a moot point because we claim the name of Christ. Like, like at Westminster Christian School, historically the kids have said maybe 20% of the kids are Christians. Um, boy, I think that's stretching it. That sounds horrible. We are, if Westminster from Westminster, you listen, we're just like this pagan place. Um, and so if someone would look at our kids, in fact, a kid got in trouble the other day because he put something up on Instagram or, or TikTok or something, and he was wearing a Westminster shirt. And somebody got all mad and said, you're representing Westminster. Yeah, but I mean, he's, <laughs> if he's representing Westminster, that might be more appropriate what he did. It's more in tune with who we are. I mean, we, we were talking about uh, school is just a battlefield. 
I mean, it's just like I'm worn out every day. Because like it used to be, I, I don't, used to be is not fair either. It felt like it used to be. And maybe I'm older. That we started maybe at ground zero and, and we had to build. Now I feel like we're in the negatives. And we're having, to, we're having to build just to get to zero. There's just not a Christian conception or worldview. And a lot of it is because they come from families that don't really have ties to any sort of understanding of Christianity. Um, I have a question. The staff and administration and everyone there, it sh- should not it be trickling down from every day? You guys are well, trying you, to come into it? I, I wouldn't. You shouldn't. The hope is that we know Christ. Kids asked me before, do you think there are teachers that work here that aren't Christians? So then you've got that issue. Yeah, just because you're religious and you can, make an, you can say you know Christ doesn't necessarily mean anything. And I would also say, in order for it to trickle down, you've got to be pretty intentional with kids. And that's a lot of work. So especially with pandemic and stuff, I think people are just tired. I had COVID and I'm still fighting. I'm still, I've got an inflammation still. I, I just, I get heartburn every time I eat caviar. I'm kidding. I've never had caviar. It sounds horrible. So I, 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 I'm like, I get done a day and I just like beat me up now. I, I, yeah, I'm afraid so. And I don't like it. Well, I, I don't. I, yes, I'm not. That's still our policy. She said, didn't we accept people who at least one parent was Christian, was a Christian or made a profession for Christ? And that has not changed. I don't need to out myself here. It has not changed, but whatever. It is what it is. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I don't need to get fired here. <laughs> I apologize. Florida Christian, you need a Bible teacher? Don't worry about this. I think that you need to think about the trickle-down effect. But even that, for me, that statement... She's talking about the trickle-down effect. The staff or the division, whatever, wherever you are, is that you have uh, some viewing of how that child is going to work out. And really, you just need to be more of a... Mm-hmm. 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 We're coming alongside the Spirit is working. And we do see that. We see kids really respond to some of this. I think one of the things, and Kelly and I have talked about this, that we, we've had to recognize that if we're not spiritually responsible, we can do what we can do, but we can't own it. So if a kid chooses to be self-destructive, we can only go so far. We're, we're, we're with them for a little bit in school. We're not with them on the weekends, generally. Uh, we're not in their homes. And homes are so fractured. I mean, even good homes are fractured. We, we've been talking about family and marriage. And this, the, the horror stories they tell. Horror is the wrong word. They're not being abused. But just, it, it's, boy, it's, 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 it's a little bit mind-boggling or maybe saddening. Um, and, and, yeah, the trickle-down... I mean, it, it, you're, let's say you're trickling, but you're only trickling with them a few minutes a day, really. So it has to be the Spirit. And that's our prayer, that we tell them that in chapel a lot, that, that we, we, if God's brought them here, we, we think like within the next 30 or 40 years they'll come to know Christ, that we're in this thing for the long haul. And that there's, there's not a time, you know, there's not an expiration date. And if he's brought you here, and it's true, you can't get away from it. I, had, I talked to a kid the other day who's, been trying to get away from it and they just said I, 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 I know I, I believe this I just I kind of don't want to but there's there's really nowhere to go so so it's a weird place but um, we're back to this some people are just nicer than others um, we've got kids like I won the Bible award growing up I know you can believe that I was a nice kid I wasn't a Christian I was just a I was a quiet kid who read my books and knew my Bible because I was a preacher's kid and a missionary kid and so I, I don't know how many times I won the Bible Award. You know, what a nice little boy. And I think, you have no idea. I mean, I wasn't a bad kid. I didn't, do, I didn't do anything externally bad. But my thinking, it wasn't like deviant. It just was, I didn't agree with a lot of it, but I had nowhere to go. I couldn't tell that to anybody because in my world you had to agree with it. Um, and so I was a rebel internally, if that makes sense. Um, and then he says it's, he, he does talk about the end of page four here. He talks about, you know, as God works in us, um, it's something that they can freely give them or free, freely refuse. And, I, and if you look through that, keep saying, say what, say what, say what. 
uh, that he talks about, you know, you can really resist and run away and not do anything. And, 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 and that, I think that is true to a point. Even Calvin talks about you can w run away, but he says you're tethered and God brings you back when he's ready. Um, so, you, 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 you know, you, you, um, you can read the notes there. And then O is the one on page five. If I'm not going to read these notes, I shouldn't write them, right? You know, I can't but write the notes even if I know we're probably not going to go over them. Otherwise, I feel like I cheated. Uh, so I'm out there thinking, oh, what's wrong with... I'll, yeah, no, it's, there, no it, it, there's something I just... I, 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 it's like I can't, I can't take the corner. And I think, be, be, but whatever. Okay, oh, it's when a person realizes that his niceness is not his own gift but from God, and when he offers it back to God, it's just then that it begins to be really his own. And I said that when we'll preach. There's this, there's this kind of interesting... Uh, two-step between God and us, but he's really doing the dance and we're not, even though we feel like we're doing it and it's his. I was going to say something else. Robin, you talk about the trickle-down. And, and, and Donna, if, if the trickle-down worked that easily, think, of, think, think what our kids would be like. And we really, you know, and they've lived with us and yet they've got their own sort of stuff to deal with. Um, my daughter <coughs> has sort of moved away from Christianity because of some sort of family stuff and then but she can't get too far it's fun to watch her she goes so far she doesn't like organized christianity she just doesn't get it and she doesn't like that it's become uh and as you're going to hear this one that, that that sometimes it seems like it's more republican agenda than it is christianity and so she has trouble with that um but she can't quite jump away from it so she's been listening to a podcast of a guy named rob bell well rob bell in our conservative circles is kind of a heretic but he's teaching the Bible in this, on this podcast. He used to have a church, and he wrote this book that just got him eviscerated. On, it was almost like universalism. Anyway, she's listening to his podcast, and she said, hey, I, I'm listening to a guy that you'll probably hate. And his, his name's Rob Bell. And my response was, Taylor, you're a, you're a smart girl. You can listen to Rob Bell and take what you want and take what you don't want. I'm just thrilled that I understand you can't get away from it, and you keep moving a little closer and a little closer. If it takes Rob Bell to bring you in, that doesn't offend me one bit. Just because I wouldn't accept some of what he says doesn't mean you can't listen. I bet you there's a bunch you can learn from him. So I, I tried to make it a positive, not a negative, because she, she's, she's trying to find her own way back. And I think, isn't that fun? Isn't that cool? Yes, sir. Yeah. We're talking about televangelists now. Yeah, we, we criticize them. Yeah. And their cars are nice. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you're... You're arguing that God can use them. Yes, yes okay. All right. I, I thought that's what you were saying, but then your response, I thought, oh, maybe he wasn't, and I misheard. Yes, um, because often what you hear is if you're not with us, you're against us. Yes. And if you don't fit our, if you don't check off everything we do, so we write off everyone who's not a good Reformed Christian, especially in the stripe that we are. And then we become sort of TRs, totally Reformed, and, 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 and everyone's going to hell but six of us. You, you got it, but it, go ahead. But as I say, but if you understand that the, that these guys, Joel Osteen's not responsible to us. He's he's got to he's got to stand before God, and and he may be a good guy, he may not. He he gets kind of beat up in the press, but I don't know him. I, I know his house is big and his cars are nice, but whatever. Those are minor things. I don't care. Uh, he doesn't have a '99 Jeep, man. Come on, baby. So I'll be right there. So if God uses him and one one person comes to know Christ, you know what? Praise God. And, I don't, I, don't, I, don't have to be, I don't have to be responsible for Olstein. He's a grown adult. Yes? I was just, I'm not traditionally very Christian. I watch Olstein a lot. Yeah. But he has one saving grace. Every, he quotes every sermon. He's talking about Olstein. Olstein. Every sermon. Every sermon. He asks people to come to Christ. Yeah. All they need to do is confess their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Yep. So when we get to heaven and they're wearing Joe Olstein t-shirts, we'll know. Oh, another Joe Olstein guy. I said when we get to heaven and they have t-shirts on of who who was who was instrumental in their lives. And <laughs> have at it. Yeah, well, when you you've got the health and wealth gospel, however you want to define it, there's not a lot of room for grace. Yes, sir. Uh, Didn't, isn't part of his testimony he preached from the pulpit for a number of years before? Oh, he yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't become a Christian until after he was a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he went to seminary, uh, what, Boston College or Boston University, and didn't believe any of this stuff. It just was intellectually, I think, intriguing. And then he came to know Christ through Billy Graham. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, so God's up there. I, I was listening to a... Um, uh, a class lecture this week by Ian Duguid, and he's talking about Psalm 3, where uh, Absalom revolts against David, and David's crying out to God, and he just, he reiterated for me that God is sitting on his throne, and he's at peace, and sometimes we think God's up there sort of juggling, he, he everything that happened, and he was talking about in, in your life when things happen, it's really the sovereign God of the universe has decided that this is okay for you. So we look at Olstein, we look at these different things, and we look at the mess. Even I look at Westminster, and I think, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Man, he's seated, he's in, in, in our children, and, and uh, it's good. It is well, and um, it's, it's Psalm 46 that then ends, because I was listening to that one too. Be still and know that I am God. Ah, it's such a great, you like that one, huh? Be still. That's a good one, be still. Uh, and be still is not passive, it's really active. Being still is an active choice. You're breathing. I'm not a great breather. All right. So here we go, turning to Christ. So he says everyone needs to be saved, nice or not saved. That, he said that's really the issue. So you don't really look at people and say, are they nice or not nice? The real issue is, do you know Christ? So turning to Christ. Uh, he says, recognizing our need for Christ, even if you are nice without him. I think that's the dangerous part. If you're nice without Christ and you see Christians and they're not very nice, and you say, well, I'm nicer than you are. Why would I want to hang out with you? And... Um, Often people who have these natural kinds of goodness cannot be brought to recognize their need for Christ until one day the natural goodness lets them down and their self-satisfaction is shattered. I think that's God's kindness. Again, the, the thing that Lewis doesn't talk about is behind all this, in all this, is a very active, always active God who's moving in hearts. Uh, he's always working. There's, there's, there's not like a half time, uh, and it's not up to us. He's moving in hearts all over the place in all sorts of different ways. And, and I think the way you do move is you become aware that, oh, I'm not as nice as I think. Yes, sir. I think of Jesus speaking to the rich young ruler, the wealthy, you know, having your father today, the commands of God. Oh, I've kept them all. Okay. Talking about the rich, rich young ruler? Yeah. Follow me. He said, no. Yeah. Yeah, so the rich young, young ruler couldn't really follow Jesus, but he'd done everything he thought. Yes. Question, Donna, but the question was, with her purplish hair. Taking in the final context. Yeah, you wish you had, then you'd be like me. Divorced Divorce and unemployed. <laughs> nah, I'm, today, I'm a high school today. Bible teacher, close. <laughs> yeah, after today I am. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know, uh, I was going to say, I, I, I had another story of when I lost a job, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. But then, but whichever yeah. way Christ is preached. As long as Christ is preached. Yeah, yeah. No, you're good. That's right. I remember that. It was in my heart. Mm hmm. <laughs> I think Paul's writing, so I can't. Yeah, what is? It's in, it's in the letters. I wanted to say 2 Corinthians, but I'm not sure. Philippians. Philippians. There you go. Here comes Robin. Can't would know. <laughs> John Bradford. Yes, the Apostle Paul. You think his friends called him that? Hey, Apostle. Yo, AP. All right. Yes, you do have a comment. Bob has a comment. Didn't even raise his hand. He's going to talk. Can you believe the hubris? He's going to solve it all. If what now?
sure. I mean, I, I don't know if it would solve it, but it would certainly help. He's saying if we'd read Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Or spiritually dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I think it, it is an introduction to Scripture. And, and that would be a place where maybe we, we as churches, I say that generally, have so, dropped the ball. We, 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 I'll include me, we as Christian churches often have moved away from Scripture. And so you don't have, you don't have people who are really just exegeting the text. And that's, I think... A necessary part of the word of, of God is alive and active. It can come in all sorts of different sources, but that's one of the ways. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the commands are not, we, we think of them negatively. Again, I'm, I'm listening to Do Good Stuff, and we're doing this section on the genre of the law. And it's just that the, the law is a delight. It's not, it's not this oppressive thing. It's, it's God's gift that we might live life in a way that's more in accord with how he's created us. It's a speed limit because there's a bad corner ahead. Yeah. All right, so uh, in other words, it's hard for those who are rich in this sense to enter the kingdom. Uh, it's different for nasty people. Uh, the, the, he, he then has this long list, little, low, timid, warped, thin-blooded, lonely people, or the passionate, sensual, unbalanced people. That's probably all of us, huh? If they make any attempt at goodness, they learn in double quick time that they need help. He said, so sometimes it's the nice people who really have trouble, but everyone needs Christ. It's Christ or nothing for them and taking up the cross and following or else despair. Um, so he's saying, every, but his point is everybody needs Christ. What we don't need is religion. Religion kills, Christ gives life. Um, you can do it. Not here, though, because you're a woman. <laughs> I'm not making fun of it. I just thought that was funny. <laughs> I'm not making fun of women or not women. Remember, I'm ordained PCA. <laughs> it is funny. You know, I, I, one of my best friends at Princeton was a woman pastor. And uh, her husband was the, the pastor's husband. And it was so much fun. Like, I, I had to decide she's not responsible to me. And, and if she believes God's called her, I had, to, I had to just give her space, even if I was uncomfortable with it. But it was so much fun talking to her husband. He had the best job in the world. Because if you're a pastor's wife, there's expectations. If you're a pastor's husband, there are none. Because most men, they, women see as incompetent anyway. So he was doubly incompetent. <laughs> He said, I don't, do, I don't have to play piano, I don't have to do anything. He says, I work in the nursery once in a while, but that's it. <laughs> All right, a warning or encouragement for every one of us. A warning to the nice person. Uh, beware. Much is expected from those to whom much is given. This is number two. If you mistake your own merits for what, you are, really, what are really God's gifts through your nature, if you're contented with simply being nice, you are still a rebel. Uh, for those of you who are nice, man, your niceness counts to nothing. And I would argue... You really aren't as nice as you think. Um, we're all pretty nasty. You just got to figure out where. Filthy rags. I'm, so, I'm sorry? We're filthy rags. Yeah, we're filthy rags. We, 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 there, are, there are times when I'll either think or say something, and I'll think, just like a, a kid one time sat in a chair, and then he left, and I took this chair, and I, uh, I got the Lysol, and I just, it was a, one of those chairs that you lean back, uh, uh, like a cushion and I just doused that thing with Lysol so it was wet. Well, he came back and sat down on this wet thing. Of course, he knew it was me. And he looked at me and he said, Reed, here's a kid. Reed, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Every once in a while when I look at what choices I make or, or, or attitudes I have, Reed, man, what's wrong with you? But I'm not so surprised anymore. Now when I think, I think, Reed, what's wrong with you? And you go to the cross and you say, Father, you know what's wrong with me. So we're filthy rags. Uh, and, and I think it's important for us to be able to be in, I think it's important to be in an environment where you can say that. You're allowed. That's where I think pastors have the hardest time, difficult time, is oftentimes we expect them to be a, a cut above. They're not a cut above. Yeah, they just are. And how lonely. Like, where's the pastor go? Uh, I would say, when they talk about burnout of pastors and, 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 and you know, you look at these guys who've gotten themselves in in uh, compromising positions. I think offense because they're just lonely. They got nowhere to go. Last night I went to a birthday party for a friend of mine. I've known him since he was 10 years old. He's 50 now. And uh, it was just so much fun. And then another kid who's there who's in 54, and I've known him since he's three. 
And it was so much fun just to hang with the boys. And I thought, this is good. Those are, you know, I don't see them a lot, but when we're together, it's just, the, there's nothing needs to be said. It's the boys are together. Um, so one of them I'm 10 years older than. He was my youth guy for a while. He lived at my house for a year. One, one I'm six years older, and I lived at his house when I was in college. We were roommates. We've done everything together. And it's so nice. If I got in trouble, I could call either of those guys and say, hey, I'm in a little trouble here. What you need? You know, we're, we're, your, we're your backup. Let's go. So um, a warning for every one of us, a warning to the nice person, encouragement for the poor creature. This is how Christ works. Like in the text, he keeps reminding those who are nice that you're not. And he keeps remembering those who are just overwhelmed with their sin that, that God's grace is even greater. If you want to use Paul, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. The pictures of a river where the river is full, grace just goes over the banks. And, and God's grace is incredible. If you're poisoned by a wretched upbringing and somehow it's full of vulgar jealousies and senseless quarrels, I'd love to have been at the table when he was writing this, if he used different adjectives and he tries, you know, throwing them in. Saddled by no choice of your own with some loathsome sexual perversion, nag day in and day out. Basically saying if you're a kid and you were abused and you're carrying the scars of this and because of this, you're just, you, you just can't put the pieces together, however you are abused, whether it's sexual or physical or emotional, and, 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 and you're just... You're, you're three quarters of a person. He knows all about it. And you are one of the poor whom he blessed. Man, that's good news, huh? Um, who was it? A, 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 someone texted me last night. Let me see if I can find this real quickly. She'll be pleased that she's on radio and three people are listening to her. Um, she was talking about the extra night. Daylight saving tonight. You, can, you have time for a second cigar. And I went, yep, especially since you had to share the... F I told her, she asked me if I was smoking a cigar at some point, and I said, well, I had to share it with Jesus. And she said, well, you had a time for a second one, especially if you share it with Jesus. And I said, he brought his own. Nice, the wine too? And I said, yeah, he brought the good stuff. He's generous like that. And I said, he is. Jesus is a good dude most of the time. And her response was, most of the time, you disagree with him on some stuff? I said, well, he has anger issues at times, and he likes prostitutes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, right? And tax collectors, she added. So, and she went on to say he's the life of the party. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, 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 Jesus, if he went to a party, he'd be attracted to the prostitute. And I think, isn't that cool? Because who else would be? Who else would be drawn to them? That he's saying, man, this is it. Encouragement for the poor. But really, all the underdogs. He's always the strays. The theological term is stray. Use the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The disciples were strays. We're strays. I think I, I, I had a friend tell me that because I was telling about some kids, Kent and Heidi, with, with, with their two adopted children. Um, they were part of the six that, that, that I got custody of, I don't know, 30 years ago. Uh, the, the court was going to take them away, and I happened to be there, and I said, can I just take them home? And they said, yes. So all of a sudden, we had six children, and I had just gotten married. And so Nick and I took the two, and Kent and Heidi had two, and then we the two older girls we found homes for. And I was telling a friend this, because he, he grew up with one of the girls. And he didn't know that. He said, man, you, you, and I have stray animals. He said, you just have been in stray, into strays your whole life. And I thought, I'll take that. That's a good way to go. I'll take strays. Uh, and so here it is. Yes, you're exactly right. Strays. Um, he knows all about it. You are the one of the poor. He knows what a wretched machine you are trying to drive. Isn't that a great answer? You know, it pulls to the left. The brakes don't work. It's a wretched machine. What to do? We're actually going to get through this. Excellent. What do you do? You keep on, and you do what you can. That's a great line. You say, but that doesn't make... One night, I told you when, when I was just so overwhelmed with all the junk I was going through, I can still remember. It was a house I was, I was renting down on 185th Terrace, and I was sitting there walking in, and, and I called my brother, and I just... Or I called Wilf, and I just said, I, I just can't do this. And, and Wilf said, man, let us carry the load for you. And I called my brother... And he gave me this great spiritual advice. And I've told you this because it, 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 it still astounds me. He said, just go to bed. And I thought, that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's the greatest advice I'd, I've had. You wake up in the morning and you, it, God in his kindness restores. Do what you can and then go to bed. You know, you don't have to fight the battle all in one day. It's just a slow, methodical thing. And the good news is the Spirit's working one day. And notice what he put, does, perhaps in another world. Lewis really likes the picture of the other world. He talks about, you know, the, the, if, you're, if your view is for the other world, you, you have more, you have more uh, ability to help now. He talks, you know, Narnia only makes sense when you see the other world. Perhaps in another world, but perhaps far sooner than that. 
I love it how he, that, that, that sounds like Narnia right then. Uh, he will fling it on the scrap heap and give you a new one. One day he will fling what? Your life. You know, but, but think of how you're different now than you used to be. Think of the ways that you exhibit more joy. Think how you're more compassionate. Uh, think how you're kinder and more self-aware. You say, but I'm not. I bet you are. Um, I, I think if the Spirit's moving in us, he's, he's making us more childlike, more like Jesus. Now you say, but I've got all these. Don't worry about what you don't have. Look at what you do have. You know, you, if you're a basketball player, you, you used to not be able to dribble. You can now dribble with both hands, and you can do layups. But I can't hit a jump shot. Don't worry about it. We're working on that. But you got the layups. Shoot layups. Um, and then you may astonish us all, not least yourself, for you have learned your driving in a hard school. Some of the last will be first, and some of the first will be last. Niceness is an excellent thing. Uh, and he says we ought to try to be. It'd be nice to have a world where people treat each other well. But, F, we must not suppose that even if we succeed in making everyone nice, we should have saved our souls. Pity to be nice and condemned to hell. A world of nice people content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable word, world, and might even be more difficult to save. Th think about, I, I think what Lewis is addressing is our Western culture that really emphasizes being nice. What's fascinating is, um, even those who say they're nice can't be nice. Like the people who ought to be the nicest are those who are the most liberal in their worldview, right? It should be. So I have a friend who uh, we work with, Andre, who did the play. It's a spelling bee play, the 12, 20, I don't know, Putnam Spelling Bee, and it's a musical. And they got straight superiors. They, they won Dade County. Best, and it's a, I, we, we saw it the other night, and it, it's just incredible. They, they're so good. He didn't, he's the only play that won that didn't get invited to state championships. And I said, why not? Well, in the, as one girl sings, and she talks about the spelling bee, in the background are her parents. Well, in the original play, it was two dads. And they made it a mom and a dad. And because of that, they wouldn't let them advance. And he talked to them and said, he appealed it and said, but you said perform it in the way that it would be acceptable at our school. It's Westminster Christian School. We couldn't do the two dads. And they said, no, this is how we wrote it. This is how you had to do it. So there's where the niceness looks nice, but it's really not nice at all. It's much more judgmental than we would ever be, I think. And, I, and so he told the kids, guys, uh, they kept you out for a good reason. You actually stood for something. So, um, for mere improvement is not redemption, though redemption always improves people even here and now and will in the end imp improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. We will be nicer than nice once Jesus redeems us. Remember Paul Tripp's uh, shepherding a child's heart? If you don't deal with issues of the heart, you just have them obey because they're afraid or whatever, then all you got is a bunch of Pharisees. And is that what you want? You want, you know, kids who say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, but behind your back they're doing all this dastardly stuff. No, you, you, you want there to be consistency and wholeness. God's goal for us through Christ, why Jesus became a man. Here we go, and, and this is another of his themes, as we did some of these last week. God became a man in order to turn creatures into sons. And remember, sons is, is, is because of the, the, the system that they lived in. Not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. If you know Christ, you are a new person. In uh, some of, the, some of the, the Jewish rituals, when you would be baptized, they'd put you under and pull you up and then give you a new name. Why? Because you are a new person. You've got a new name. You are not the person you were before you knew Christ. Um, it's not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. What book is that? Uh, six, The Horse and His Boy. There we go. Got to go back and read Narnia. This is pretty cool. It's fun to think his theology works itself out in, in something that creative. You wonder if he was taking notes as he was doing all this. Of course, once it has got wings, it will soar over fences, which could never have been jumped and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. As, as the Spirit is redeeming you and you, you, you understand you're a new creature, you, you're, you're, you're going you're to outdistance the person who's externally attempting to be nice because it's coming from the inside out rather than the outside in. But there may be a period while the wings are just beginning to grow when it cannot do so 
And at that stage, the lumps on the shoulders, no one could tell by looking at them that they are going to be wings, may even give it an awkward appearance. That's a great, that's a great description. You're growing wings. But just because right now you can't fly in certain areas doesn't mean the wings aren't growing. It just means you've got stumps. <laughs> you don't have it together. Um, we're, we're, still, we're still learning to fly. That's a, great, that's a great paragraph. Even though I read it before, that's a great paragraph. An argument against Christianity in response. The argument. And then he finally says, so, so why, did he become, why did Christ become a man in order that we can be sons? Children of God. Who's sore? He's moving us towards freedom and joy. He's moving us towards consistency, uh, less self-destruction. Isn't it nice to go through a day and not look back and think, why did I do that? Doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're making better choices. I still make really bad choices. What? I said you have days like that. <laughs> yeah, so do you. So do you. Or you talk to somebody and they responded to you in a way that was negative and you think, oh, I actually responded to them appropriately. Or somebody will point it out to you. And that was a kind response. You think, oh, I didn't mean to. I really wanted to get them. But you didn't because you're learning, to, you're learning to fly. So then finally, an argument against Christianity and a response. The argument, you can easily find some stupid and unsatisfactory Christian and, so, and say, so there's your boasted new man. Give me the old kind. <laughs> That's good. I, I, I got hurt in church, and so I want nothing to do with Christianity because I met so-and-so. I remember one time at the Key, uh, I must have been in college, and, and a family came in, and their son, I don't, know if, I don't remember if he had special needs or he was just a pain in the butt, but he was moving. We were sitting back in the East Bay, and he was moving around, and I remember one of the deacons in the church, I can still picture him walking up slowly, and man, he yelled at those parents for the behavior of their children. And I thought, he was a good dude, but he was a little cranky at times. Uh, maybe he was a little cranky a lot of the time, but... I thought, I'd never come back. I'm done. Uh, I'm so sorry, though. Most likely, he did have special needs. I don't remember. For some reason, that's in my mind. Either he did or I did. I can't remember which. But yeah, but I, I, was, I wasn't embarrassed as much as I hurt for them. Because I thought they, 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 they made the effort to get here. That's a lot of work, especially to bring a kid who, who you know is going to be a handful. And then to have that response. It's not, again, it's not safe. And, and when we gather together, it ought to be safe, even if it's, even if it's unnecessary. At, at, there, there's a church in Chicago called Res Church. It's, a, um, it's a, an Anglican church, and the, 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 the bishop is an African dude. And so I went there with Land, this, Landy, and uh, we went to this conference, and it was, it, they, they do the best uh, communion services I've ever seen. I mean, it's just incredible. But one of the things they have, it's funny, though, because they all wear their, their you know, Anglican garb, so they got the big hats and the robes and the stuff. And, and I told Landy, all I can think about is Monty Python. I just, I just keep laughing the whole time. They're up there doing that. But, but I love what they do. But in the back of their sanctuary, they have a pot that's maybe three quarters the size of this uh, circumference. And then it's maybe three feet tall. And it's maybe bronze, something like that, copper. And it's got running water. And the water's always just going over the edge. And, and um, all service that's going, and it's towards the back. So we would sit behind it. All during the service, people had to move and go touch the water. Like little kids would be over there sitting, and you could just see their bodies. They'd start looking. You know? And so I like to sit in the back of church just so I can watch the world. That's the fun part. And so, so the little kids would come and run and just splash and then run back. And people like who had a, a, a Catholic background, as they moved up to take communion, they'd come and dip it, and then they'd, they'd do. And, and it was so cool. But he was telling me when they do baptisms, they all circle around this big pot. And then he looks at the people and says, what do you want to do? And if they want to be, if, if someone says they want to be sprinkled, the pastor will just take water and do this. And, and their floors are cement. And, and, and if they want to be dunked, they'll grab a chair and they climb in and jump in. And he dunks them. And he says, by the time the thing is done, it's just, everything's a mess. Because there's water everywhere. And I thought, isn't that a cool picture? It's messy, but it's safe. Um, I was at a friend's house and he'd gotten remarried. And, and the, the, the person he remarried, I had known before I knew him. So I'm at their house eating this meal. And, I, you know, and, and all of a sudden, we had lasagna, and they had white carpet, and he spilled his lasagna. <laughs> Grown man, and he spilled his lasagna. I enjoyed it thoroughly. But what I enjoyed even more is he got reprimanded severely. <laughs> it wasn't safe, but it sure was fun. <laughs> Church ought to be safe. You can spill your lasagna. It's all right. 
You can spill the water. It doesn't matter. We'll clean it up. You know, your kid can talk. You know, we, 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 we can have a child's room. I have, I have mixed sort of ideas about that. You know, we're going to cordon you off. I don't know. I understand why. But, um, you know, I, whatever. So here it is. Uh, so you both said, give, give me the old kind of response. If you once have begun to see that Christianity is on other grounds probable, you'll know in your heart that that's only evading the issue. He says, by doing that, you're throwing out a smokescreen. The issue isn't really, are you good at math? The issue really is, is math true? The issue isn't, do you like Christians? The issue is Christianity true. And if it's true, regardless of those who say they're Christians, the, 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 what's at stake is deeper than these people. It's the truth of Christianity. So, what can you ever really know about other people's souls, of their temptations, their opportunities, their struggles? So you're judging other people and saying, oh, I like the old people, but you don't know what they were like before. And you don't know what they're dealing with. And you don't know what's going on. So if someone treats you a certain way, you have no idea what they're dealing with and why they treated you that way. What percentage of people, I was reading somewhere, are just in like deep sense of pain? We don't know that. And so for us to reprimand them when they do, you have no idea what they're going through. So they say they're a Christian, but, but man, they just may be in such pain. Uh, one soul in the whole creation do, you do know, and it's the only one whose fate is placed in your hands. If there's a God, you are, in a sense, alone with him. Here's what he says. Don't worry about them. Take care of yourself. It's you and God. You cannot stand before God and say, well, so-and-so. I've told you, with high school kids, one of the biggest traits I see is a refusal to take responsibility. And so... Um, a kid got, my daughter got one detention in high school. And I don't, I, I think you should get detentions. If you don't, something's wrong. But the reason she got detention is, is her band teacher called out a kid and said, you're chewing gum. And he said, yeah, but so is Taylor. <laughs> Look, you little butthead. So she got detention too. I mean, she was chewing gum, so you get the detention. But it's you and God, not you and God and, oh, but them. Um, you cannot put him off with speculations about your next door neighbors or memories of what you've read in books. Get over yourself and deal with God. What will all that chatter and hearsay count? Will you even be able to remember it when the anesthetic fog, which we call nature or the real here we go, and the, or the real world fades away and the presence in which you have always stood becomes palpable immediately, immediate and unavoidable. What are you going to do when you die and you stand before God? That's what he's saying. He just says it much more creatively. So we'll talk in class about how do you know this is true, Christianity, and what if it isn't? And what's going to happen if it isn't? Because kids will say, I just have faith. I mean, what do you have faith? Well, I've just chosen to believe it. But do, how, would you try, do, have you ever asked questions about it? How would you know it's true? Oh, it just is. And I said, so what happens if you die and you wake up and you realize it's not true? And, and Islam was right. Uh, or, you know, there's nothing which would be better than Islam being right. Uh, and so this is reversing it and saying, what are you going to do when you stand before? It's, a, it's the assumption that what we believe is true. And what are you going to do when you stand before God on that final day and you look him in the eyes, he looks you in the eyes and you say, but my neighbor. And you say, what? What? Isn't it weird that you, as much as we live people, we really live alone. Like it's our world, our thoughts. People care about us, but ultimately it's us. We're born on separate days. We'll die on separate days. Uh, we have our own, you know, we have our own experiences. And, and, and we have to take responsibility for us. And he says, nice or not nice, what are you going to do with God? I mean, this is Lewis's, in this book, this is really call to, call to salvation. You, you, can't, you can't avoid it. Uh, the tax man cometh. And, and there's, there's a next line that goes with that. It's from Shawshank Redemption. I don't know. He takes it from Scripture, from one of the Psalms, the Lord cometh in something. Uh, he's not happy. Brown used to say, God's coming and boy is he ticked. Um, that's the idea. Um, all right, so there we go. So it's good news and it's bad news, depending on where you are. And the good news, as Joel Osteen would say, is you just need to confess your sins and have faith in Christ. Right? Am I repeating him correctly? And that, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. And so even today as we're in the service, pray for those guys. I, think, I appreciate what you said, Jerry. It's so easy to be judgmental of everybody. But... If they're hearing about Christ, they're not responsible to us. They got to stand before. They got to do this one-on-one -on -one someday. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a there's an, a, you know, a, 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 what is it? Performance evaluation someday. Um, pretty bizarre, huh? Isn't it bizarre to think that we think about eternity, but it's already begun. But it, it, 
there will be a day when we cross to the other side, whatever that means and whatever that looks like. And we know so many people that have, and so far, you know, all but a few have, have, have done that, all but one. Um, and he's come back to tell us about it. All right, comments. Whew. Spellbound in your silence. Let's pray. So, Father, we begin by praying for Joel Olstein and other televangelists this morning as they pray. That their words may be clearly pointed to Jesus. All the other stuff is just fluff. But people may hear Christ and forget that other junk. I'm sure there's so many times we say stuff and you and your graciousness highlight Jesus and the other junk we say you just sort of let slip away. We think of Res Church in Chicago. May they remain the way they are. We just think of all the churches around us uh, within spitting distance and a little further that today as, as uh, the ministers get up to speak, uh, that Jesus might be exalted. Thank you for scripture. May it become more and more a part of our lives. And then thank you for the spirit. That sounds like an understatement, that you would see fit to call us children and put your spirit in us that we might be more like your son, that you already have cemented uh, in us eternity. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be with me also. We think of those who have gone before us. We don't quite understand how all the pieces work, uh, but we do know that for eternity in a new heaven and a new earth, we will live out this life that you have called us to. So individually, you know our stories, um, we think of Mary who's not here, think of Joanne, that you would be with them this week and whatever they're dealing with, and then each of us, meet us where we are. Uh, we think of Richard already as he comes next week, both for Sunday school and the service. Uh, give him freedom, and may he have joy again for Kent. As he talks about David and Jonathan this morning, may that be a fun time for him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And amen. And amen, and amen. I'm so glad he's doing the Old Testament. I, I love it.